thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Andreas, for joining us. Um, we were on a panel together earlier today uh, in front of a bunch of Goldman Sachs folks waiting for the money to pour in from that. <laughs> um, but it is just always so interesting to listen to Andreas, and I personally have many burning questions now. So I, I do want to get through a few of them, but then we'll open it up in a bit. Um, I think you all know that Andreas Schleicher is one of the world's, if not the world's, leading education expert. Um, he's also Teach for All's newest board member and uh, is an incredible advocate for, for our work. Um, just a little bit that I've learned about your background, which I think will help everyone put all of this in context. Um, you can tell me if I've gotten any of this wrong. But um, Andreas was trained in Germany as a statistician and a scientist. Uh, and early on saw firsthand the flaws in Germany's education system, which was widely thought to be at the time one of the world's best. Um, his father is an education professor, and when he entered the field in the late 80s, it was dominated by tradition and ideology, as it is still in many places around the world. Um, but Andreas had the insight to realize that it was important to bring data and rigorous analysis to education to shine a light on what was actually working and, and what wasn't. Um, he created the world's first international reading test, and after joining the OECD, persuaded countries to sign up for PISA, which has really shifted the thinking from measuring inputs, like how much countries spend, uh, to outputs, how much kids are actually learning. Um, this is a test, as, as I think most of you all know, that's administered every two years to 15-year-olds in 65 countries. It's become the gold standard for international comparisons because it truly does measure critical thinking skills um, and problem solving skills in math, reading comprehension, and science. Um, and it also breaks down the performance um, of kids from different income brackets and so reveals the extent of educational disparities in different countries. So you can imagine it's just a complete, you know, incredible like treasure chest of potential insights. And in fact, Andreas and his team uses the data that they gather to help leaders around the world understand you know, what the countries that are making the most progress on increasing overall education levels and reducing disparities are doing differently. So thank you for being here to share your insight with us. Um, I need to remind everyone who's out there, uh, first of all, you all please do think of your own questions and we'll invite those. Um, but anyone watching remotely can use Yammer or Twitter. Just use the hashtag AskAndreas and we will try to get to your questions. <laughs> As, you know, as many as possible. Um, so uh, just a few big questions. So, so, and one question was one I think that I got, but you should have gotten on the panel this morning, which was, you know, what, what's the bigger issue? Is, is the bigger issue the difference in outcomes between countries, or is it the difference in outcomes within countries based on kind of student demographic groups? Yeah, first of all, it's great to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> um, you can, the statistical answer to that is very clear. Sort of, we have about one third of the performance variation that lies between countries, and about two thirds of the performance variation that lies within countries. See, uh, that was a much better answer than mine. Yeah, <laughs> but, the, but that's sort of the, the, that's the easy way to sort of to look at this. I think the bigger question is really when you look at this over time, and you can actually see that. Uh, you know, this morning I mentioned you take Korea. Uh, in the 1960s, Korea had the standard of living of Afghanistan today, one of the least developed education systems. Today, every young Korean leaves school with a decent qualification, mm. you know, whether from poor or rich family. And that's the more important dimension. You know, in the one hand, you can say, well, much of the variability in performance lies within countries. But if you then take into account how much change there has been, we can no longer divide the world between rich and well-educated mm -hmm. nations and poor and badly educated ones, which used to be the case for centuries. So I think yeah. this dynamic aspect is really the important part of this, that there is a lot of change there, and uh, there's a lot you can do to move up yeah. in the league within a country or across countries. And what is most impressive is that you do have, I mean, you take a rather small country like Finland, but you know what is so impressive there is only 5% of the performance variation in the student population lies between schools every school succeeds. And that, those are the kind of things that tell us what's really possible. Yeah. Now, of course, we're all wanting to know what the 
biggest keys to success are. Like the country's Korea, you know, I mean, which is a sort of complicated <coughs> story when you get into it, I think. But just based on the little I've been able to learn. But I mean, what do you see as the biggest drivers of the countries that have been able to both raise educational levels and to reduce disparities? Uh, tough questions, but actually you do see commonalities across countries. And of course, at the heart of it is always teachers. Now, the quality of an education system can never exceed the quality of the people who work, the teachers, school leaders. That's pretty obvious to say, but uh, it works the other way around as well. You know, the quality of teachers can never exceed the kind of learning environment that you provide for schools, the kind of opportunities you provide for the development of teachers, the yeah. career paths you provide for them. So those, I think, are at the, at the heart of it. But, I mean, Korea is an interesting case because in the 1960s, when they started to move, they had no money. So resources were actually very, very scarce. But they made a very important choice at that time. They basically said, we value the quality of teachers more than the size of classes. So they basically got the best people into teaching. They pay a teacher about, in GDP-related terms, twice as much as in the United States. But they give them three times the class size. Mm -hmm. and, but it was a really smart choice because that enabled them to really upgrade the profession, provide them with a challenging environment. And over time, they could ease both sides. Yeah. But it's one of the now, kind of... Now, I, I don't want to go down too much of a tangent here with Korea, but I just have to say this because I just read uh, Amanda Ripley's book, as I said earlier, and she <coughs> follows an exchange student to Korea, and, and it, this, what sh this exchange student found mirrored what I learned as well when I spent a couple days there earlier this year, which is that, I mean, as Amanda and this exchange student seem to display, yeah. I mean, the kids are sort of sleeping through the school day. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. in fact, even talking with some of the more influential educators mm. in Korea, they themselves don't seem to believe in the teaching force or in the schools, but, but do believe in the drive in, within the broader culture and the families and among the kids to attain a great education, which mm -hmm. leads them to invest a lot in these after-school mm -hmm. programs and these hagwons, essentially, where they literally mm -hmm. go to school till 11 p.m. at mm -hmm. night. I mean, you may have a different understanding of this, which is why I ask. I mean, I, I just wonder. It's, it, I guess reading all that and thinking about what I saw there myself leads me to wonder, how do we shift a whole culture? Mm -hmm. hey, you know, I mean, what we, I, I also think there's a lot of challenges that Korea is facing, and the good thing is they're aware of it, and they're working on that. You know, yeah. they are very, very serious about this. But I think what we can learn from them is, on the one hand, that uh, the value they place on education. You know, every child, every parent, every teacher, everyone knows, you know, this is my key to success. If yeah. I don't succeed in school, I'm not going to get into it. I cannot buy myself into the prestigious universities. No employer is going to hire me. Yeah. So the value placed on education by a society is enormous. Uh, I don't really think that the private tutoring in the afternoon adds that much in value. Mm. You know, it's all about test preparation, content knowledge. I do think that schools do a quite good job in, if you think about high order thinking skills, mm. there's a lot of good things happening in schools which you don't see in the afternoon mm -hmm. pr test preparation. Actually, I think if you, th the, the, edu the, the economic value is, is huge. You know, mm. Korea spends 3% of its GDP on private tutoring or 2.7 or something like that. Very yeah. little money. I don't think it's a good investment and I don't think it adds that much in mm. terms of, you know, what counts for to success today. But Interesting. Parents still, you know, they use every minute of their yeah. children, every, every, every dollar yeah. they have to foster that. So. Yeah. Now, something you said earlier today, you said, you know, it's interesting because the schools in the United States, you know, there's less freedom and less sort of ownership to be able to make the decisions at the level of, you know, teachers and, and schools than there is in some of these other, the most high, you mm -hmm. know, the highest performing countries like in Finland. Like, how do you say more about that? Yeah, it's a very interesting kind of phenomenon. On the one hand, you can say, well, the United States is the country of local control and education. Now, that's sort of <laughs> what you would get as a first impression. But if you actually get into schools and yeah. serve with them, as we do with PISA, you actually see that when it comes to the things that really matter in education, you know, whom do I hire? How do I work with them? What do I teach? How do I teach? Mm -hmm. That schools in the United States have a lot less discretion than schools in most of the high-performing systems. For example, every public school in Finland 
or Shanghai has a lot more discretion than a charter school in the United States. Mm -hmm. Or maybe my private schools, I can't judge very much. But I mean, sort of, uh, there is a lot of trust in the people in the schools, but also a lot of, this is this combination of professional autonomy in a collaborative culture. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, teachers do what they want. There's a pretty sort of uh, rigorous system built around schools. But there's a lot of sort of professional responsibility mm. that rests at the front line of delivery, which is not what you have in the United States. Yeah. There's a lot of district control over the. But then when you look at actually what, coming back to your first question, what predicts outcomes, it's actually what happens at the front line. You know, you can see a very clear positive correlation between professional autonomy in the school and learning outcomes. You don't see any relationship between, you know, whether you have control at the district level, state level, or federal level. Mm -hmm. And and how do you see, you know, it's interesting because you're such a huge uh, fan of data for for good reason, of course. But I mean, do those countries, because you know, you read a lot about how the highest performing systems actually focus less on the standardized testing and the kind of accountability systems. Is that true? Well, you know, you always have to strike a balance between accountability and improvement, how you, do, how you use information. And I, I would see, say that the United States is on one extreme, you know, the premium is on objectivity, the premium is on standardization, uh, you know, you don't want anything that is contestable. On the other side of the spectrum, you have countries that may use data as intensively as the United States, but that use them mainly for sort of, you know, this is for you information to improve. Mm -hmm. there, you always have to make trade-offs between objectivity and, and validity, mm -hmm. really, you know. And um, there's more emphasis on providing the knowledge, professional knowledge that people need, rather mm -hmm. than information is really used primarily for improvement purposes, rather than accountability mm -hmm. purposes. So I don't think that uh, the high-performing nations are less sort of data rich or knowledge rich, but they use the information usually more, yeah. Yeah. less for external accountability, more for lateral accountability. You know, what, what actually strikes you in some of the highest performing nations is that, you know, every teacher knows what every other teacher is doing. Every school knows what other schools are doing. There is this tradition of being accountable to your counterparts, not being accountable to someone in the government. No, that's mm -hmm. really a very different there's so much to dive into and all this like I, I how do you create that like how would how would any given system you know move from where it is to a world more like that like what do you think are the building blocks yeah i think uh, it has to do i mean um, it has to do with creating shared opportunity it just has to do with professional learning communities building the kind of structures and support in the schools that help people work together learn from each other mm -hmm. if you go to singapore what they have done on professional learning. They haven't invented the concept, by the way. That's actually, I mean, the concept mm -hmm. exists in many countries, but they have actually used it. You find teachers videotaping classroom lessons and then looking at them together and day after day, month after month. So it's not sort of something. Um, mm -hmm. If you study in the National Institute of Education, teacher education in, the, in, in Singapore, you know, you have video access to classrooms all over the country. You know, you mm. can see what's happening. You can learn from the experiences. It's sort of bringing the knowledge of people together, mm. sharing knowledge. That's how you create it. And then mm. the second part is, you know, how do you motivate people? How do you attract the best people for the most challenging classrooms? It has to do with careers. Mm. You know? Yeah. I, there were Asian countries, but also Northern European countries, are really good in creating incentives that really attract the best teachers into the most challenging mm -hmm. classrooms. I want to ask two more questions, which I've sort of, which we were discussing a bit earlier, but, but then we'll start opening this up because I want to see where you all want to dive in. But one has to do with, and it's sort of bouncing off of your last comment, you know, we need to figure out, as you say, how do we elevate the effectiveness of and the caliber of our teaching professions? No system is better than its teachers. And, you know, many, some will see Teach for All programs as being somewhat counter to the efforts to professionalize teaching because, you know, calling on folks to commit just two years uh, <laughs> rather than, you know, whole lifetimes and, and then investing in, you know, short-term trainings rather than much longer-term pre-service training at least. 
Um, and I wonder, as someone who is a champion of both elevating professions of teaching and of this kind of teach for all model, how do you how do you think about the relative, you know, what it's going to take to elevate teaching professions and, and, and where, what the role of, of this model is? Well, you know, I think part of the problem that we have is traditional teacher education is that we have, in our minds, an industrial work organization. You know, everybody learns in the same way, everybody goes through the same process, everybody works in the same way. It's this kind of, you know, someone in the government develops standards and curricula and accountability, then in the people at the front line are the industrial workers who replicate whatever has been prefabricated. And, I mean, I exaggerate a bit, but that's sort of the mindset that is behind it. So you go through one way to get into the profession and then it becomes a golden cage because you've only learned that it's very hard actually to do something else. I think we need to think, if you, if you, if you look at the best performing systems today, they have moved to a truly professional work organization, you know, where there are many ways into teaching, where there are many ways out of teaching, where there are many career perspectives for teachers within the profession, you know, I mean, uh, if you would have a teaching profession where actually you could advance, you know, teachers curriculum development or teachers management uh, leadership, you know, probably people would stay for more than two years. Um, it's the kind of, the future of the teaching profession really needs to be a lot more diverse, offer a lot more vertical, horizontal opportunities for career development, and then you don't have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Then I think, you know, everybody will, I mean, what you are doing is what most other knowledge-based professions have done since a long time. It's not inventing something. It's doing it in a systematic way. And I think that's really, really important. I think we need to get away from this kind of, you don't attract talented people into that kind of work environment. Mm -hmm. Not for one year. Yeah. I think that's where we really, yeah. and that's not to do, I mean, the salary component is the one that worries me least. Um, it, you don't, I mean, money doesn't make that much of a difference for people's, you can pay, Luxembourg, you know, offers teachers fantastic salaries, you know, about three times as much as you get in the United States. Mm. They still don't get really good people mm. into the profession Interesting. because of the work organization. Yeah. The other thing we were talking about earlier was just what you've seen in teacher union leadership around the world. And um, it was very optimism producing to hear you talk about that. Um, but what, what, can you share more about your observations of the trends there? Yeah, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, I really think that, you know, every education system gets the union it deserves because the, this, the, the mindset of the union is often a reflection of the work organization. If you have a very industrial work organization, you get an industrial union that wants standardization. That's the goal of the unions in an industrial work organization. If you have a knowledge-based work organization, the unions become professional organizations. And I actually have seen more movement on the parts of unions than on the parts of many governments mm. in the last 10 years. Unions have become protagonists of the profession. I was, there no, no union competes with the, um, the JTU, the Japanese teacher union. You know, they are, you know, and I know this when I meet with them, you know, they are asking about, you know, what are high-performing teachers to what other countries, what, what, they want to know how the profession emerges, develops. Mm -hmm. That was not the case 20 years ago when they fought for salaries and working hours, teaching hours. In, in Norway, uh, Denmark, unions are really the, the drive of the profession. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, very encouraging. I think that's something, but you know, again, it comes back if your work organization doesn't give teachers the kind of freedom and flexibility to organize themselves, then they are not interested in that part of the work. Mm -hmm. They just look at, you know, how many hours do I have to work, mm -hmm. what I get paid, and that yeah. becomes a conversation. It's a, it's a huge chicken and an egg situation, though, because it's, it's, you know, some of where the fact that teachers sort of are as regulated as they are has its roots in some of those union contracts. Yeah, but I think, you know, if I tell you an example, I mean, one, one which really fascinated me, and that was in Sweden. In 1994, Sweden introduced individual pay. So basically moving away from standard contracts to having school principals, more or less deciding what teachers get paid. Yeah. And at the beginning, you had unions on the street, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of people protesting, all these kind of things. Two years later, 
the system had a 70% approval rate by unionized teachers. <laughs> Suddenly they saw the system really works. You know, if I want to become, mm -hmm. go to a rural school, I'm actually going to get yeah. more support. The, the profession and the unions became bigger supporters of this. So again, you know, I think you need to, I, I don't think these things are written in stone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to some of these questions, so feel free to add your own. Um, Amy Grandov at, at Teach for All asked, um, a school cheating scandal in Atlanta, Georgia, has been in the news recently. I assume you've seen maybe some of the reports of that. 35 educators were indicted for falsifying student test data. And there are also anecdotal reports of U.S. parents keeping their children home to avoid standardized tests. I must admit it's happening in my own kid's school today as we speak. Um, and teachers complaining that teaching to the test is reducing the quality of education in their classrooms. Um, how can we ensure that data and analytics are applied, interpreted, and accepted in constructive ways? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, and, uh, I, I personally, I don't think we have too much data. We have much too little real knowledge in the profession. Uh, but, you know, if we only use it from an external perspective, you know, people are not stupid. People start to sort of manipulate the system. Everybody mm -hmm. does those kind of things. So I think if data is only used for purposes of external accountability, without creating value for the student, without creating value for the teacher, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer? The answer is to create data system that actually create value for parents, that give parents really good information, that tell student not only did I pass the test, but you know, this is where my strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. are, that tells the teacher, you know, this is what my students do well, this is what they don't do well. And if, if you do that, you create a very different culture, then people see that this is actually yeah. a useful exercise. We have always this idea, you know, there is learning and there's testing. And we need to get those worlds integrated. You know, yeah. the testing should part, should be a part of the learning experience, and the learning should be benefiting from the testing. That's why I believe part of the answer lies in having a much better balance between school-based, teacher-based tests and standardized tests mm -hmm. than what you have currently. Yeah, creating a much better mix of different instruments that actually mm. resolve that part. Are there some countries that are doing that really well? Yeah, I think you find lots of, I mean, some countries that have a strong tradition on this, um, Nordic countries in Europe in particular, but I think some countries that have made a lot of progress, like the United Kingdom, started out exactly where the United States is basically all tests is done externally, towards giving teachers and schools a much greater role in, and you can start in simple ways, you know, give teachers a role in marking tests. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like more work, but if you have really good open-ended constructed mm -hmm. response types in the test, you as a teacher learn a lot mm -hmm. from your students' responses by comparing them, contrasting them. So I think there's a lot of inroads into making this mm -hmm. a productive exercise. Mm -hmm. If you have some company coming into your school doing a test, going out with the data, this is a waste of time yeah. for everybody. Now. Yeah, interesting. Um, this is a question from Twitter um, following on the discussion we just had about the teaching profession. How can the teaching profession be elevated in countries with little money to raise salaries? Well, you know, I think this is a tough question. The resource issue is always a big part of the equation. But again, you know, the money countries spend on education explains only 20% of the performance differences that mm -hmm. we see. A lot more has to do with how we invest our resources. You know, how do we make sure that the money spent on education actually makes it into the classroom? You know? mm -hmm. And even in the United States, half of the money never makes it into the classroom. Mm -hmm. First thing, how do we trade things like you know teacher salaries versus teaching time versus student learning time versus class size? A lot has to do with allocating their resources. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. I think countries with very limited resources have huge spending constraints. But at the very same time, even there, you can see huge performance differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I said this morning in a, in a meeting, you know, the, some of the rural provinces in China that are really work in very, very difficult conditions, they come pretty close to the OECD average performance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't deny the challenges of resources, but I think the use of resources is something where it can be yeah. a lot more creative. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm here. I'm Deb from Teach for All. And I uh, recently went through a master's in education program at Brooklyn College, mm -hmm. um, sort of as a second late in my career master's. Mm -hmm. And I found there um, a huge range in my classmates from 
very brilliant, dedicated teachers, current and future teachers, two people who I was gr like incredibly grateful were not my own New York City public school student children's teachers. And what I realized is that, you know, this, is, this was a public university. It wasn't like Bank Street, Columbia Teachers College, um, which are probably more selective. But what I realized was that there are people here who, sh who are not ready to be teachers. And I'm wondering in your experience in the countries that um, have education systems that are, are excelling, is the process um, of, of educating teachers more selective or uh, is it something that, that is more like aspirational, harder to get into, more challenging? Yeah, I think the selection process is really a big, big part of the success. But you know, if you just make that more selective, you choke off supply. So the, this, this is sort of a very tricky issue, you know, how do you elevate the status of the teaching profession and then you can sort of be more selective. Again, you know, in Finland, they get 10 applicants for every post on teacher's college. Everybody in society wants to become a teacher. It's the second most prestigious profession, but it is prestigious because it's defined as one where you really work with colleagues, you are part of the instructional system, you're not only a teacher in the classroom, you are really the education system. And I think that's where you need to start. And then people want to become teachers, and then you become a lot more selective. Mm -hmm. What's also interesting, you know, the way you get uh, selected in Finland, actually making the f getting, passing the test in the first year to teach at college, a lot of people do. It's the second year where you spend a lot of time in the school, in the classroom, where you get really selected. It's judgments made by people, you know, fellow teachers, principals, who really sort of try to see who has got the pedagogical talent to become a great teacher. And again, that's something that is hard to accept in many countries. You know, people think this has to be a very objective process. You know, it has to be test-based. And I do think that, you know, when you look at many countries doing it well, there's a lot of professional judgment going into judging, you know, who has the potential to become a really good teacher. But um, it requires the profession to be attractive, you know. It's not just a matter of making teacher colleges more selective. Mm. Thank you. Um, Georgia Gillette, uh, the head of communications at Teach for All, you know, says that at our conference in Santiago, you said that PISA scores show that quality and equality go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, that's what you see. You don't see any country that has made it into the top 10 on the PISA test that has not also achieved a very small impact of social background or learning mm -hmm. outcomes. You just, I mean, statistically, you cannot become a great education system without the capacity to moderate mm -hmm. the impact of social background. And it, that's true. I mean, your northern neighbor in Canada is doing really well on it. Immigrant children in Canada do better in school than, than in, the, in, in the United States suburban middle class yeah. high schools. Um, and um, Asia, usually very good at that, you know, and that's because teachers are equally demanding for all students. They basically put a lot of effort to help students from disadvantaged background to succeed in a country like Japan. It's your, um, you, you lose face as a teacher if mm -hmm. you don't succeed with students from difficult backgrounds. It is something that we have consistently seen that there yeah. is no quality equity trade-off you mm. don't win in quality by sacrificing equity yeah <coughs> uh, thank you i i guess when introduce yourself uh, sorry my name is jared hove i'm with uh, teach for all um, i guess when many people think of standardized testing uh, often thoughts often leap to subject area content in terms of what's being tested um, I'd be interested to hear you speak in the role of sort of non-cognitive -co attributes mm -hmm. and educational outcomes. Um, uh, thinking specifically how systems and organizations can use this, given that at least some of the research I've seen is very longitudinal from like a pre-K intervention mm -hmm. you're getting mm -hmm. life outcomes when the participants are in their 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, how should organizations and, and systems use this data to inform and measure ongoing mm -hmm. what they're doing? Yeah, you know, I, um let me take an easier part first and stay in the cognitive area. I think that cognitive testing has the potential to go a lot beyond content. In fact, if you look at our PISA test, we often give students all the content knowledge. You know, there's on one page where they need to know everything they need to know, and the test is really about can students extrapolate 
from that? Can they apply that knowledge in a novel situation? Can they creatively use? There's a lot I think we can do with good tests to actually assess critical thinking, problem solving, creative use of knowledge, and so on. So I think that's where I would put the, put the emphasis first. Then the non-cognitive attributes, you know, I mean, they are important predictors for your success in life, you know. And, uh, if, if you don't believe that what you learn is going to open life opportunities for you, if you don't have the kind of motivation to learn, you're not going to learn beyond school. But um, actually, I think many of them can be assessed in, in often quite simple ways, using questionnaires. In, again, in PISA, we have good instruments to assess metacognition. We have good instruments to assess the quality of school life. We have good instruments to assess motivation, uh, self-concept, aspiration. And I think they're very, very important variables. You know, I, I wish teachers would have access to that knowledge in addition to the cognitive outcomes. If I sort of see, you know, my students do well on a test, but they totally lack, you know, an understanding of the life opportunities that lie behind what they've learned. They totally lack the kind of motivation. I would want to change my teaching. The problem is that the kind of standardized tests that we use typically don't provide that information. Actually, we had a very interesting experience. About a month ago, I was in Washington, and we launched a new exercise that we called Pizza for Schools where we actually give individual schools the possibility to say, okay, you can now apply the PISA test. And one of the things that we learned when we actually got the results is that schools were very interested to know where they stand, whether they could compete with Shanghai and all these kind of things. But they were even more interested in learning about those non-cognitive attributes, you know. Why are students in my school, they're doing okay, but why are they not motivated? Why are those students sort of lack whatever self-concept in those things? So I think we should do a lot better Testing these things is very, very hard to do, and you need very complex instruments. But I think even simple questionnaires can get you very, very far as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question from Charlotte Phillips, who says, for countries that have turned around their education systems, where did they start? Because with so many aspects that need to change, what, you know, what's the right sequence of steps? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of, you know, there are many kind of chicken and egg issues here, mm. you know. You, you need to, at the end of the day, get many things right. But yeah. the clear starting point for many countries is to get the standards right, you know. If you do not know, and if your students, if your teachers, if your parents do not know what really good performance is, they're never going to get that. Mm. And you can see, actually, for many countries, it has been about raising ambitions, raising standards, raising expectations. And actually, PISA validates this, you know, you can see that's the, these are the biggest predictors mm. for success. You know, something that is, whether, the country ha whether a country has a tough high school exam, the simple existence of that exam predicts a lot of the mm. variation in the performance of nations. You mm. know. Having those things, that's the starting point. What do you think for the US folks? Like, what do you think about the Common Core? I actually am quite positive about it. I mean, the Common Core reflects pretty much what you see in many high performing systems yeah. in terms of the approach they take. But, you know, the Common Core is an idea. It, yeah. it actually translates that into expectations for students and translates it in a way that, you know, those expectations don't get leveled down by student social background. I mean, mm. some of the biggest challenges here is that teachers tend to level down their expectations for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's what reinforces mm. that impact later on. Students get twice penalized. Mm -hmm. They come from a disadvantaged background and they get into a less demanding environment. So getting yeah. that right, getting the common core standards implemented is a really big challenge, yeah. but I think it's a promising start. Really. Yeah. But that's only the starting point. I think when you get sort of those expectations right, you need to think about what kind of support yeah. systems you develop for schools, for local administrations. How do you make teaching more attractive and so But mm. unless there is no country in the world, I mean, I give you an interesting contrast, Norway, one of the most expensive systems in the world, in Finland. Both Nordic countries, same culture, same context. They, there's no excuse why one should do as well as the other. One system is the, one of the world's le uh, leading systems, and the other is an average performer. The only real difference between those systems is the level of expectations. Finland yeah. values excellence. Norway sets minimum standards. Yeah. And that's the whole story. And minimum standards are regressive in every mm -hmm. context. Yeah. This is fascinating. So how do you increase people's 
I mean, it gets back to the how do we change a culture, right? Like, how do we how do we increase expectations all around? You know, I think the biggest challenge for any education system is to raise public demand. You can't push a rope. You know, yeah. if parents don't, but I, I, that has to do with transparency. If parents understand that education is going to make a difference mm -hmm. for their children, if parents start to value education. They are going to be the driving mm -hmm. force. Yeah. You know? School choice alone, by the way, is not going to resolve the problem. Yeah. Because our parent survey shows very clearly that parents don't even consider the quality of learning outcomes. It comes rank five or six when they make a choice for their children. So again, you know, creating public awareness, creating... Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think those are mm -hmm. things that are really important. Yeah. I, uh, I'm Eric. I teach for America Columbia from the Mississippi Delta. It's been a fascinating conversation so far. Around this culture piece, I, I'm curious if you know of any analyses that tie social policy that's not ostensibly related to directly to education, mm -hmm. housing, health care, whatever it may mm -hmm. be, and, and correlation to student outcomes. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, it's a question that gets, gets often asked. We don't have comparative data on this. I can only say qualitatively that in many high performing countries, social policy and educational policies are very closely integrated, and they're integrated in the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, the school in, in, in very different ways. You know, in, in Japan, if you are, as a student, get in trouble, no, the police is going to call your teacher, not your parent. Sort of, it's the, it's the real that the teacher is responsible for the well-being of the student and feels responsible for that and has the time for that. You know, teaching time in Japan is very small. You might think, oh, well, they have nothing to work uh, about uh, two-thirds of what teachers in the United States work, but the working time is over 50 hours because there's so many different responsibilities. So mm. it's not about integrating social and educational policy at the government level. It's making that happen mm. in the school, that, for example, schools provide social services, educational services, and that's what is really about moderating the impact of social background. Finland, 30% of instruction time is delivered outside formal classroom settings. As a teacher, you have enormous possibilities mm. to actually help students who are in need, but also foster specific talents. And I think this that's is just fascinating. I mean, I haven't heard this point before, but is this true? So like in the Finlands and the Shanghais and, and, on, and on, like, is there truly, I mean, or have we sort of broadened the notion of the responsibility of education? I think clearly in the Nordic countries, in Europe, Finland in particular, you can say that uh, the school has a social mission. The school is the center of the community mm -hmm. and it plays that role. In uh, China, it's a bit different, but uh, there you have a very, very strong sense, I think, uh, the student-teacher relationship is very strong. Yeah. You have to also imagine many children in China in schools live in their schools, you know. Uh, they don't, uh, because particularly high schools are far yeah. away from where they, yeah. where they grow up, so teachers are caretakers. They have to sort of, and they feel a very, very strong responsibility for their children, mm -hmm. and uh, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that we talk a lot about across the Teach for All network is, you know, sort of the importance of, of building leadership capacity within, you know, each community mm. and, and each mm. country, meaning because this is a systemic issue mm -hmm. and especially, I mean, it becomes so vividly clear when you spend time in a place like the mm. Mississippi Delta that if we're really going to ensure opportunity for our mm. kids, it's got to be about educational opportunity, mm. but also economic development and improving the health care system. So ultimately, I guess the idea that's kind of, as you know, at the core of the Teach for All mm. kind of model is this, this notion that we need to develop the leaders of the future who will deeply be, be deeply committed to ensuring educational opportunity and just opportunity for all kids. And, and yet that notion is so unpresent in mm. the public discussions about what it's going to take to actually get where we're trying to go. I mean, how many people say, oh, leadership capacity? They're talking mm. about teachers. They're talking about standards. They're talking about... And I just wonder how you think about that. I, I agree with this. I think sort of... And, and the more responsibility rests on students, uh, on schools, the more sort of these responsibilities get broadened. You need leaders, you know, instructional leaders, people who bring teachers together in a school, mm -hmm. who sort of move the, the whole agenda forward, people who think about assessment policies, about instructional policies. The question is, you know, uh, we often, in the, the biggest mistake that we might make is that we basically say, okay, leaders is when you get sort of at the age of 50, you know, you just move through a system and one day, you know, they mm -hmm. transform you. 
or you make the mistake you think the best teacher is going to be the best school leader mm -hmm. and I think the answer is if you go to Singapore it's very interesting leadership capacity is developed from the very very first day you know in the school they watch out for the you know there are many career development opportunities mm -hmm. but one is leadership and they yeah. watch very carefully you know who which teacher has the potential to become a great mm -hmm. leader and then they nourish that experience mm -hmm. they get sort of leadership training they get leadership experiences and so it's developed early on. You as a teacher can move into this, grow into this responsibility. And you have some school leaders, you know, in their middle 40s becoming leaders of their school. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of the, the identifying leadership talent early, developing it. Those are absolutely critical for yeah. success. Yeah. And, and, and I'm assuming, I mean, how do you think about the need for leadership even outside of our schools? Like, you know, political leadership mm. and civic leadership yeah. who deeply understand these yeah. these issues. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about the same kind of thing, and I don't have an answer to this, but I think the, the capacity that we need in local administrations, in districts, at the political yeah. level, in, in, in education and beyond, is one of the biggest challenges because there are yeah. no mechanisms. They, these people get politically sort of yeah. thrown into their careers. That's... A, yeah. One of the biggest, yeah. one of the things, if you go to Finland, what's really interesting, what I, what I really like there is that if you're a school leader in Finland, you spend two thirds of your time in the school and one third of your time in what they call a system leader. So you basically work in a municipal office and you can bring the real experience from the real life into that office and you can bring it back to other schools. Yeah. You can see, oh, well, you know, and it's sort of using the people in the schools to become actually part of the bigger system, part of the yeah. administration, rather than say, yeah, you work at school, somebody else in the ministry yeah. office. That's, I think, sort of moving people around, I think, yeah. and giving them system responsibilities is one way to. Yeah. I mean, given that the core mission of each of these Teach for All programs is essentially to do this, like to cultivate mm. the future leaders, not mm. only for the education system, but for the political mm. system and for all sectors mm. of society who will be committed to this end. Mm. But yet, given the absence of sort of an understanding about how crucial that is, I mean, what would you recommend in terms of our almost building demand for mm. this model? Mm. Yeah, I, I, again, you know, I don't have really much yeah. evidence. And this is a very, very hard challenge but I think that's it's the crucial you know without that leadership you don't get public support for education you don't get the value placed in education you do you don't even get meritocratic societies yeah meritocracy in society very much depends on people actually valuing mm -hmm. what the, mm -hmm. the role that education plays but I don't have any yeah. kind of simple yeah answer yeah that. Um, shifting gears uh, a bit and this relates to some of the questions that were Send in here. I mean, you know, this topic which we were also discussing this morning about is education local or national or is it global? Um, I mean, what do you think about this notion that education should be part of any given country's foreign policy? That sort of a concern about the quality of education beyond our borders could in fact be one of the keys to building an environment that enables all of us to be better off. Absolutely. You know, I mean, Poor education in other countries hits you directly, I mean, you know, in terms of all sorts of things, you know, and um, um, violence and so on. It hits you in terms of poor consumer demand, you know. It's something that the education in China affects you more than or equally than the education in your mm -hmm. own country. And some countries are actually drawing direct benefits of it. For example, I mean, I was just in, in Hanoi a couple of weeks ago and I was surprised that many of the vocational programs in Vietnam are actually sponsored by Australia. And I sort of then I called people in Australia. Wow. This is great. Work what you what you're doing. And they say, yeah, you know, we need qualified workers. We need sort of. I mean, it was for them a totally natural experience. <laughs> that is so. That uh, you know, we can have the boat people from Vietnam without qualifications come to our country, or we can have people who have actually gone through a decent <laughs> schooling. And so the, even the economics of that work quite mm -hmm. well, and, and, and vice versa. I mean, you, if Vietnam has a better educated population, you know, Australia mm -hmm. is going to sell more value-added goods to them. I think, you know, and it's not just an economic, I think the social imperative. I mean, one of the things, if you, if you look at the Middle East in these days, uh, it's absolutely appalling. I mean, they have all the money, but the poorest education. And, mm -hmm. um, I think if we can change that part of the equation, we can change a lot yeah. of things. You can put 
billions of billions of dollars in Afghanistan, but unless you change the kind of skills, the talent pool of yeah. that country, none of that money is going to yeah. make any difference. And, and how do you think we're doing in terms of approaching education in that way? I mean, this is an, an interesting mm. question from a guy who, uh, Nick Anna at Teach for All, um, who says, essentially, have you seen more governments, more intergovernmental organizations embrace, embrace this assertion that in today's global economy, our benchmarks for educational success should be global? I think that's pretty much accepted. I mean, um, really, that's where the. I mean, why, what makes PISA so popular really yeah. is because countries realize, you know, I can become better by national standards, but if other countries are moving faster, see, I I'm going to lose out. Although no. this is slightly different, because I think what leads people to be obsessed by PISA is they're like, oh gosh, we got to do better. It's like the competitive. <clears> so they look at these other <throat> countries like we got to do better. Versus, how do we raise all the boats? Right. Yeah. But I, I do think there is a, is a global perception on this. I think countries are very aware of the consequences of low skills anywhere around the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, the talent pool of a country is the best predictor for the, the level of mm -hmm. economic and social development. And if you don't solve that part. Mm -hmm. But I also, I mean, on, on the encouraging part, we actually do see that if you think about development aid, there's more and more countries that prioritize education mm -hmm. in that that basically say, you know, we invest in skills in those countries for our own benefit, for the benefit of the countries, is, is actually the biggest win-win investment you can make. If you invest in consumption in those countries, you know, that money is going to be lost sooner or later. If you do invest in the skills, it's good for you, it's good for mm -hmm. other countries. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, but I do think the trend is going in that direction. I think there's a lot more understanding for that. Yeah. You know, the world is a lot more interconnected than even we believe now. Yeah. And, the skills of people. It's also sort of, and I think it's important to say this in this context, a lot of people have fears about it. You know, you see this rapid growth in China, they build one university every week. And a lot of people have the fear, okay, these people out educate us, they're going to take our jobs and so on. But actually, this, none of that is actually borne out by economic theory. We've studied that a lot. You know, every Chinese graduate, every additional Chinese graduate is going to add value to education in the United States. Yeah. So actually we benefit. So far, one day, you know, we might see a, see a sort of deflation or inflation on the labor market value of decrease. It's not happened by yeah. now. I have to say, you're very optimistic about this idea that people get this. I, I have to say, even running around looking for resources for mm. Teach for All among the kind of philanthropists and leaders mm. in this country, 95% of the time it's like, why would we ever mm. think about the rest of the world? I mean, mm. in good part because they're looking at the outcomes in their own neighborhoods and thinking we just got to focus on that. Um, but it's just been sort of fascinating to see the absence of sort of a global constituency mm. for this idea that our global educational outcomes need to mm. go up. We should work on that. I mean, that's actually something where probably the, the OECD, my organization, could help you with this because we have we, the very, very good windows to speak to those people. And yeah. I think, but again, you know, my overall sense is that I think everybody realizes that the cost of not doing it is far yeah. greater than the cost of solving that problem. Mm. I mean, think, of, think about the amount of money you, that you spent on Afghanistan or Iraq or those kind of things that are actually uh, all results of yeah. that have to do with talents. And this is good. Well, we need to have a board level discussion about that because I'm actually pretty <laughs> yeah. convinced that what's in your mind about what is the reality here is not in the minds of many of our global leaders like I just in it's fascinating to hear the trends though I, I, I got to look at the data in terms of the foreign aid dollars in mm. the US and where they actually go yeah. and and on from all of the governments um, mm. be fascinating now in closing um, you know, I've, we've heard you kind of advocate for this model um, for Teach First in the UK where you had a good deal of experience, uh, but, but really now knowing that, that this model is popping up in, you know, already 27 mm -hmm. countries, but soon to be many more. How do you think about, you know, the role that, this, that these programs can play in kind of catalyzing the broader changes that, that we need? Yeah, again, you know, I think this uh, Teach for All is, is a fantastic resource and I think it is the catalyst for, for leveraging innovative ideas, sort of bringing sort of 
And you know, quantity is not just the, the, the issue, it's not just about making every teacher a teach for all teacher, but I think it's using the teach for all teachers to transform education and giving providing ideas, leveraging other and I think that's where 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 the future of this is and I think that's I mean there's nothing that the teaching profession needs more than innovators, people who are willing to sort of to to, to, to drive transformation, yeah. drive change. In this, and I think that's why you have this huge potential, and uh, you have motivated people, people with the capacity, with the skills, with also the experience that is, goes beyond the kind of mm. teaching experience. I think there's a huge potential, and I also think there's a lot of openness. You know, I mentioned to you one of the um, we collected recently data from the teaching force. We did, you know, we do PISA for students, and we did a kind of survey for teachers, and. On average across countries, 70% of the teachers tell you their biggest complaint is, you know, I work in isolation in my classroom. Nobody tells me, you know, what I can do better. Nobody, I don't know what other teachers are doing. Sort of, I'm left alone on my devices. Everybody complains, but I do not have access to good information, to good. And again, you know, that's where you can play this very, very powerful role by bringing in sort of alternatives, ideas. And I think the more, the. You need a lot of these ideas, but then you need to sort of spread them, leverage them, mm -hmm. make sure that they are shared with teachers in the education system. And I think then it's a huge potential for change. And you can see, I mean, Teach First in the UK is now the third biggest recruiter. They have also, in quantity terms, reached the critical mm -hmm. mass that they actually have a huge voice mm -hmm. in the teaching profession. Mm -hmm. That's not so, so much the case in many other countries yet, but I think there's a lot of potential for this. I think that's. Yeah what a knowledge profession should be like. And I, I really think that's why I value the work that you do so much, that yeah. you really bring this to bear. That's terrific. Well, I know no one who travels more, <laughs> and I'm sure great personal sort of exhaustion, um, and also has more, just spends more time at the highest levels of governments all around the world, shaping our future education policy. So we're just so honored that you would take the time out to spend time with us. and. I know lots of us will be reflecting on your comments and they will, they will inform our, our trajectory as we move ahead. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.